Hey everybody, at home at Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well. Today is part one of a two-part review I'm going to be doing on the Cambridge Evo 150. Uh, this review will be the quick overview, uh, you know, basics, what's it for, who's it for, how does it work, um, a few specs, a few features, and then kind of what did I think of how it sounded. Um, and that's really neat. What it is, Cambridge describes it as an all-in-one network player, and it is that, but I look at it a little bit differently. To me, it is the 21st century modern interpretation of a receiver. Seriously, centerpiece of an audio system, and un unlike a receiver, this really does it all. It's a one-box solution. So if you're listening to streaming and doing things digitally, this is all you need. Uh, no other complication. Uh, very elegant solution in that regard. Now, who's the target market for this? I know I'm going to catch some heat for this, but for me, to me, it is for the audiophile that the more modern and contemporary audiophile, someone who places importance on the aesthetics of a product as well as the performance of the product. So someone who maybe has a lovely mid-century modern room with a big TV and a low boy entertainment unit to put this right on top, pride of place, um, rather than a rack of gear and amps on the floor and wires going everywhere and 27 remote controls that no one in the family knows how to use, this can fill that niche very, very nicely. And it does it really well. Performance-wise, it's awesome. Um, and as far as the uh, appearance goes, it's really, really pretty. So let's talk about its basic specifications. It is 150 by 2 into 8 ohms. It is 250 by 2 into 4 ohms. It uses a Hypex Encore amp module. And there are other far more expensive amps that use that same Hypex module. There are some direct competitors that use that Hypex module. And I'll tell you those direct competitors sonically, because I've heard them, can't hold a candle to this. It has um, the fourth generation of Cambridge's very highly praised Stream Magic streaming module in it. And let's talk about that really quick. The quality of the streamer makes a huge difference in the performance and sound quality you're going to get from your unit. Yeah, you can buy inexpensive streamers, but they sound inexpensive. They can't give you the performance that this will, even with an outboard DAC. It's the signal going into the DAC that's really, really the most important part of streaming. Comp to find a comparable streamer to this, you're going to need to spend at least a thousand bucks in my estimation. Easily a thousand bucks. By the way, it flashes when it changes tracks. It has a uh, ESS Sabre, ESS 9018, oh, I don't know, ABCDEFG chip, um, K, K2M, a 9018 K2M chip. And we'll talk about the chip in just a minute. It also has a cool feature. It has bi-directional Aptex HD Bluetooth. So Cambridge Audio makes turntables that have Bluetooth built in. So I could connect, other people do too, I could connect a turntable Bluetooth to this Aptex HD, great sound quality, wirelessly. And then I could listen to my wireless turntable through the Evo 150 to my wireless headphones. And that's really unique. That's really kind of a cool feature for sure. Um, it also has um, Maroon Ready, Chromecast, Apple AirPlay, Spotify Connect, Tidal Connect, UPnP. Um, it has native Deezer, Cobuzz, and Tidal apps built into it. Um, it has a built-in phono preamp. It has balanced analog inputs and, and single-ended analog inputs. It has HDMI eARC, which is really important. It has a stereo preamp out, so if you wanted to run two subs, stereo subs, you could use it, but it also has a single RCA dedicated sub output. It has wired or wireless networking, so I can plug a piece of cat cable into the back of this and I can access my NAS if I want to. I can also do it wirelessly. Um, it has a USB-A, so you can connect a hard drive with your music files on it, and that's what I'm doing here. That's how I get that little logo there. Uh, it has a USB-B, so I could connect a computer to it. Now, to my system, my computer, my PC, is my YouTube. That's how I watch YouTube. So, because with my browser, I don't get commercials in YouTube. Um, but I want to have the audio quality come through whatever I'm listening to. And in this case, I can plug it right into here, and it, the DAC will take care of it. Um, it has a SPDIF a coax and a SPDIF TOS link. It has connections for two pair of speakers. And it has a lovely, beautiful 6.8-inch high-definition display. It's not a touchscreen. Let's talk about that. Okay. To me, a touchscreen is only valuable if that piece is within arm's length. Uh, on a desktop, 
Oh yeah, touchscreen makes a ton of difference. But if I've got this in my rack and I'm 12 feet away, why am I going to get up and touch it when I can just pick up my tablet and interact with it, right? doesn't make any sense, my tablet or my phone. Also too, Cambridge provides this amazingly beautiful all aluminum remote control. So it's a very excellent uh, uh, display, no touch, good things, no touch. Also, as of today, it is new and improved with extra goodness. We're going to scroll through all the different screen here and show you. We've got VU meters, delicious VU meters. That's as of today, um, the 24th of, 23rd of May. Just got the firmware update from, from Cambridge. So that's lovely. All right, I like VU meters. Who doesn't like VU meters? But I don't need to touch them. So I'm going to go back to the regular screen because I know you guys are going to be looking at the VU meters all the time and not me. So beautiful. Wonderful. Now let's talk about the DAC real quick. It is a, a top quality ESS Sabre DAC, no question about it. The 90, 9018 K2M, and I made fun of it, uh, is an excellent DAC. But to me, the DAC chip is not the important part of a, a DAC. The digital part, it, all a DAC chip does is decode ones and zeros. It's what happens once that converts it into an analog waveform. How is that waveform treated? Now, so there's an analog section and obviously an analog output section. Those have to be top quality to really get the best performance out of your DAC. And this, Cambridge is really well known for their analog sections of their DACs for sure. I mean, look at the DAC Magic uh, 200M. Um, look at the edge. So the, the DAC chip is less important. It is the quality of the signal once it's converted and how it's handled. And this does an amazing job. It is sublime how nice it is. Um, and I've listened to all kinds of DACs. I've got different kinds of DACs here. I've got r to r I've got Multibit. I've got Delta Sigma. I've got, you know, Burr Brown, Cirrus Logic, uh, Wolfson, AKM, ESS. It doesn't matter. It's how the analog section is handled to me. That's more important. And that's a good segue into sound quality on this unit. So I got to admit up front, I had a bias coming into this. I knew the Cambridge, I knew Cambridge products because I own Cambridge products. I, I knew they sound really good, but Class D, I'm kind of an old grumpy, guess what, old guy. Um, and so I had some biases coming in. All Class D amps I'd heard up until this time were strident and scratchy and abrasive and good bass and kind of interesting for 10 minutes and then you got to go run and turn them down. I can't, I can't listen to them at all. There were a couple of hybrid products with tube front ends and class D back ends like Rogue. Um, those sound very nice, but I don't have a lot of hands-on experience with them. Um, I was able to put a lot of miles on this thing and it took a lot of miles for me to finally kind of resolve the conundrum in my brain about its performance and my feelings about it. And that is an unusual thing for me. I've been doing this for a long time. I've listened to lots and lots of equipment and I've listened to systems that are stupid expensive and crazy stuff. Uh, and this one was kind of an eye opener for me. Um, one of the big things for me is listening fatigue. I do honestly listen for a couple hours every day and it's important that I can do that without fatigue. I don't want to feel like I got beat up or my ears are bleeding or anything like that. I don't want to turn down the volume because it's just too much. And I had that expectation with Class D, but this isn't fatiguing at all. This is really nice. It's smooth and it's detailed. And you know what? Let's just go ahead and talk about the sound quality of it real quick. Being Class D, as you would imagine, the bass is very, very good and very powerful uh, and fast. And, and it, this is a quick amp all around. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, jazz music and some of it acoustic and some of it electronic. So, you know, Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. Um, obviously, Weather Report's a big one for me. Jaco Pastorius on bass, you know, he plays that fretless bass. And when he's down there low, you know, a big E string double bass is 32 hertz. That's the primary frequency of that big E string. On a regular electronic bass, it's not that low. But when he's down there under the 40 hertz range playing, you can hear all the texture. I can almost, I almost feel like I can hear his thumb on the string, the, the skin on the string. I can hear his fingers on the, on the fretless bass up on the neck. Uh, it's remarkable how detailed it is. And as we move up into the mid bass, kick drums have a great punch. Toms have a great punch. Uh, you know, standard electric bass stuff in you know regular rock and roll music has a great punch. Um, you know, a, 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 a bowed big double bass in an orchestra has a tremendous amount of detail. I mean, I can, I can almost hear the rosin on the bow against the strings on the bass. It's that it's that detailed. When we move into the mid range and upper mid range, this is where the changes really kind of 
uh, occurred for me. Um, if there is any sense of class D-ness to this amplifier, um, and it is just, I'm talking very subtle. It, there is a little extra detail, maybe a little extra energy in the mids and upper mids. Is it strident or is it is it abrasive? No, not at all. What it did do for me was it added details, especially in vocals. Um, it, when a singer sings, sometimes you can hear their lips part. Sometimes you can hear the saliva in their mouth. This rendered those details beautifully. Um, Luciano Pavarotti, I mean, I could hear his chest resonating. It was that good. And female vocals, you could hear, uh, you know, all of the details. Um, it was remarkable. Piano was absolutely wonderful all the way through. And sometimes you get in the upper register of a piano, it can get pretty strident. And I will say, if it's a bad recording, this is going to let you know it's a bad recording. This isn't a Band-Aid. Um, this really is kind of a magnifying glass. Good recordings sound amazing. Bad recordings sound bad, but can still be a lot of fun to listen to. A lot of the rock and roll stuff that we grew up listening to wasn't recorded that great. And of course, every time they seem to remaster it, they compress the daylights out of it and they kick the bass up. Don't get me started on that rant. This resolved everything beautifully. If it was in the recording, you heard it, you got it. And as we move in the upper frequency range in the treble, the treble was detailed. There was, you could detect the edges of those notes, especially cymbals. And it, I'll tell you what, it, I was playing some recordings I've been listening to for decades, honest to God. And there was stuff in the upper, uh, in the treble frequencies on those recordings that I had never heard before. And a great example is orchestral pieces where there's either a triangle or a chime. A lot of times they get lost in the clutter of all everything else. They're, they're very quiet because they're not amplified. It's just a little triangle. This resolved it beautifully. And I could put it in space. I could point to where that triangle was. And on some of the recordings I have, I never, maybe I sensed there was a triangle there, but it never, I never got that kind of uh, hint that it was there or that, you know, here I am kind of sound from that triangle. It was, it was wonderful. And also too, in the upper frequencies, the sense of air and space was remarkable. Um, there is a recording. Uh, I did a playlist for this. It's going to be below in title. And there's a recording from Liz Lauren Mazel in the Berlin Philharmonic. It's recorded in the early sixties of Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade Opus 35 first movement. And I could hear that room. I could hear the walls. I could hear the ceiling. I could hear the floors. I could hear the body of the cello as it was being bowed. Um, it was remarkable, uh, the detail that this gave me. I've not heard that in a very long time. Uh, and I've not heard it on anything that is at this price range at all. Most of the time it was at stuff that was 10 times its price. So great detail, great resolution. Uh, amazing. And because of that air, the soundstage on this thing, I'm used to having a really good soundstage. My AXR 100 and my Elex give me a beautiful soundstage way outside the speakers. And in some cases, I mean, almost 180 degrees either side of me. This did that and more. Um, the soundstage on this was remarkably large um, and great height. So if you have a singer was standing at a microphone, uh, you could point to where their mouth would be in space. And that's where it sounds like it's coming from. That was really, really nice. Had good width, good instrument placement, solid center image. Um, and there were a couple of recordings where, uh, orchestral recordings where honestly the depth of the soundstage, I felt like I could get up and walk into the orchestra and go all the way to the back row by the timpanis. Now, was it the 40 feet back that it would be on stage? No, but it was enough that I felt like I could do that. So soundstage and imaging on this is excellent. Um, no complaints whatsoever. Um, how would I, what would I pair this with speaker wise? As you know, I'm, I'm very big against fatigue. I, I smooth, warm, detailed, uh, is important to me. This does it, but it does, I think would bring out the, the worst in some speakers that have a bright tonal characteristic. So for me, the best pairings would be speakers with that classic British sound. And I'm sorry, B&W and Kef, you don't have that classic British sound anymore. Wharfdale, uh, the Lintons, the Elysians, uh, Harbeth, uh, Morden Short, Mission, um, Elac, my debuts do great, but I think the debut reference or Unify reference would do exceptionally well with this. Um, I think the Vela would sound good. The Carina would probably be a little bright. Um, Polk, the Reserve Series, Dolly speakers, PSB, um, Devor Fidelity, John speakers would sound amazing with this. Um, I had a buddy bring over some Martin Logan ESLs. They're a few years old 
and they sounded probably the best I've ever heard them sound. And he's got tube gear, but Martin Logan's at, on that electrostatic panel can be a little thin, a little slow, a little lifeless in the in the mids and treble. Um, they are imaged beautifully and, and are very resolving, but they just don't have any kind of get up and go to them. Um, I think uh, definitive technology, their upper level speakers would sound good. The MoFi source points would be amazing on this because this would have the control, be able to control that big 10 inch woofer on the MoFi source point 10s. Q Acoustics, 5000 series, magic. Also, for what it's worth, a friend of mine brought over his Maggie point sevens and this thing drove it without, and drove them without any problem at all. They imaged beautifully, sounded wonderful. He was shocked. He's got big Macintosh gear to run those things. And this did a great job with them, honestly. What I would stay away from, again, B&W, CAF, Focal. Um, I'd probably stay away from, oh, JBL, no way. Uh, Revel, eh. um, uh, Emotiva, it's not really price appropriate, so it wouldn't be a great comparison here. Monitor audio, not so much. Um, anything with a metal dome tweeter, anything with a poorly executed AMT tweeter, and there are a lot of those out there, unfortunately. Um, anything with a more forward sound stage, you know, like clips and things like that. A warm sounding speaker that can give you good extension and detail is would be a perfect matchup for this in my mind. So in summary, what do we got? I struggled with this one. I didn't, I didn't, my expectations were low because it was class D and this thing changed my mind on it. Um, and again, with the, the quality of the sound, the detail, the resolution, the soundstage and imaging, it's remarkable. Now, I will say one thing. I think trying to make your system sound like the performers are in the room with you is a fool's errand. It is BS. And fight with me in the comments on that one. It is completely BS. It's not possible. Maybe someday we'll be able to do it with 37 speakers in a room and psychoacoustics and everything else, but it's not possible. And I'm not even sure it's desirable. Live music sounds great and it's fun and it's experience, but aud from an audio standpoint, from a sound quality standpoint, eh, PA speakers, a big room with echoing and noise and people talking and clapping and singing along. I'm sorry, that's not what I want. I'll tell you what I think is more achievable and this gets me closer than a lot of things I've heard. I wanna feel like I'm in the room with them. And that's a, dis that's a very important distinction them being in your room or you being in their room. I want to be in their room because there isn't all of that other nonsense going on. Now, granted, most recordings, the artists aren't even in the same studio at the same time. But this got me close to that sense of, okay, I was there in that room and kind of firsthand getting to hear it. And I think that's an important thing. Um, and like I said, I don't believe it's possible to have it feel like they're in the room with you. So what is this thing? Could this be the last piece of gear I ever owned? I don't know. I think it might, it possibly could be. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford it right now. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to allocate the funds for that. I've got other stuff I need to do. But yeah, I think I could be happy with this forever uh, in my system. It has the resolution detail, sound quality, all of the things I look for, the non-fatiguing experience, all the things I look for. And my goodness, it's as beautiful as a Ames lounge chair. And I'll tell you what, this thing's built like a Porsche. It really is solid. It is really well engineered. But its sound quality is subtle, sublime, uh, resolute. I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, it was very engaging for me. Um, it gave me more than I expected. And it gave me goosebumps a lot. And when I get goosebumps, that usually means I'm really involved in it. That physical response to music, there's nothing better than that for me. Anyway, that's my review of the Cambridge Evo 150. If you like the review, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Thank you guys for getting me over a thousand subscribers. Uh, please comment. There's in the uh, video description below, disclosure, there are Amazon affiliate links. If you buy something, I make a teeny tiny commission, but it doesn't affect your price or your ability to return a product. There are playlists in there. There's a list of the equipment I use. Um, and there are, at the very bottom of the description are tons of different playlists, all the crazy electronic music and stuff that I like to listen to. So please comment. Please let me know what you thought of this. Please share with me your thoughts. Let me know what you think of the, excuse me, let me know what you think of the playlists. Please like, subscribe. Thank you so much. I am so grateful for the time you guys give me uh, watching my videos. Um, thank you, thank you. This is Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel, signing off.